الحمد لله ثم الحمد لله وأفضل الصلاة وأتم التسليم على محمد وعلى آله وصحبه أجمعين Dear brothers and sisters in Islam, alhamdulillah, we uh, continue on our uh, study of seerah. And uh, Brother Jamil filled in uh, uh, graciously the last two sessions. And my understanding that he covered uh, many stories of the persecution of uh, the early Muslims. May Allah reward them uh, the best uh, rank of paradise for what they had suffered and tolerated patiently for this da'wah. And he talked about the story of uh, Islam of Umar. May Allah be pleased with him. And Hamza, may Allah be pleased with him. Inshallah, we'll pick it up from there and continue on with uh, with another chapter. Another chapter of the persecution and the pressure that uh, Muslims and the early uh, companions of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam had to endure and had to suffer uh, through the early phases of this deen. We know uh, one man who was uh, especially hard on Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam and he happened to be one of the honorable people of Quraysh and he happened to be unfortunately a next door neighbor to Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam and that man was Uqba ibn Abi Mu'ayt. This Uqba had a lot of hatred and a lot of arrogance uh, against Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam and he was particularly uh, very daring in challenging and in trying to torture and humiliate Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. One time uh, Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam was uh, making sujood while he's praying uh, close to the Kaaba and Quraysh and the noble people in Quraysh were looking at Rasulullah sallallahu alaihi and and making fun and making uh, sarcasm out of his prayer. And then people came to uh, give a sacrifice, a qurban near Kaaba. And after they slaughtered their uh, sacrifice, the uh, bowels and the intestines and the inside uh, came out of that sacrifice. So they started laughing and, and joking about this and said, who would take this dirt, this stool, this intestine and put it on the head of Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam while he is making sujood? And Uqba volunteered for this job, for this dirty mission. And he took this and he put it on the head of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam and Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam was making sujood and then Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam continued in his prostration and his worship with all that on top of his honorable head and he continued his worship to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala until Fatima, may Allah be pleased with her came over and started washing and removing this dirt up top of the head of her father may Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala sallallahu alayhi wa sallam and then Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam raised his head and then he and in a rare moment he prayed and he asked Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and he said Allahumma alayka bi uqbat ibn Abi Mu'ayt Allahumma alayka bi utbat ibn Rabi'ah Allahumma alayka bi shaybat ibn Rabi'ah and he started counting the names of those who were gathering there and laughing at him one by one and he said may Allah just give them what they deserve and the one that was witnessing and narrating the hadith said I've seen all their bodies slaughtered on the day of Badr, one by one. Those people that insulted Rasulullah sallallahu alaihi name by name. So in, in that there is a wisdom. Badr was at least eight years after this event. We sometimes this is the the, the prayer. This is the supplication of Rasulullah sallallahu alaihi wasallam, and it it was fulfilled to the letter, but it took years. So this and wisdom in this that when we pray, when we ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala for something, don't rush Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to fulfill your prayer. There is hadith, and this is in Sahih, and Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi said, يُسْتَجَابُ لِأَحَدِكُمْ مَا لَمْ يَسْتَعْجِلْ Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will respond to your supplication unless you rush him or you push him. And they said, how do we rush Allah? How do we do it? 
And he said, you say, I prayed and I supplicated and Allah did not respond. This is your rushing Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So be certain that every time you ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala for anything, sincerely and diligently, that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will answer your prayer. Just be patient and wait. If the supplication of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam stood years before it was answered, then we might as well be a little bit patient when we ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. The same man, Uqba, has a story and he had Qur'an that was revealed because of that story and it's worth mentioning. Because what we said when we started this uh, Sira session is, is it will inshallah help us trying to understand more the Qur'an and the events that, that the Qur'an was revealed uh, for. And when we say that, uh, when you read these verses in Qur'an that were revealed for a specific event, it's not only limited to this specific event. That was the reason why it was revealed, but it's also a continuous wisdom that we can derive from, inshallah, forever. Uqba, this man, the, the Rasulullah neighbor, he invited, he wanted to calm things down between him and, and the nobles of Quraysh and Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Maybe, wa alaykum as wa rahmatullah. Maybe he would lure Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam into more negotiating. Maybe Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam would budge uh, on his position in this da'wah. So he invited Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam to eat in his house. So Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam responded to that invitation and he went to his house. And he did not touch the food. And Uqba asked him, would, would you eat Muhammad? And he said, I will not eat unless you say, La ilaha illallah Muhammad Rasulullah. I will not touch your food as long as you don't believe in Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala as your only deity. So Uqba insisted that Rasulullah should eat. This is an insult for him if Rasulullah did not eat in his house. And Rasulullah stood firm in his position because he was, he wanted him to say it, even if he didn't believe it in, your, in his heart. So whatever happened to Hamza, when he initially declared his Islam and he didn't have the deep uh, Iman, and then later on Iman followed. So he was, Rasulullah never forgets da'wah, never forgets calling to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, no matter who he is confronted with, no matter who that person is, no matter how much of an enemy to Islam and to him that person is. He still wanted more Muslims. That's his job. He's the prophet. He's the messenger of Allah. He keeps hammering that issue. So he wanted Uqba to become a Muslim. Then Uqba, and under this persistence of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa said, Okay, you eat. Ashhadu an la ilaha illallah. Ashhadu anna Muhammad al-Rasulullah. And Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam eats dinner and he goes home. So then the news gets out in Quraysh that Uqba said, La ilaha illallah Muhammad Rasulullah. Uqba has a friend that is very close to him. And that friend name was Ubay ibn Khalaf. Ubay, we will mention his story later on. Every time Ubay sees Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, he tells Rasulullah, I will kill you. And Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam answered back, Insha'Allah, I will kill you. So Ubay had as much hatred to Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam as anybody in Quraysh. And Ubay came to Uqba and he said, Wajhi ala wajhika haram, hatta tabsuqa fi wajhi Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. He said, my face on your face is forbidden. That means I will never talk to you. You are not my friend anymore. We're not companions anymore. Until you spit in the face of Muhammad. And then Uqba started thinking, should he lose Muhammad وسلم, or lose Ubay ibn Khalaf? Ubay or Muhammad? And then he chose Ubay. And then he went to Rasulullah and he spat in his honorable face. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala reveals the, the, the very end chapter of this. He goes all the way to the day of judgment and this is an Uqba. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, يَوْمَ يَعَبْدُ الظَّالِمُ عَلَى يَدَيْهِ On the day that the transgressor bites on his hands in regret. يَقُولُ يَا لَيْتَنِ اتَّخَذْتُ مَعَ الرَّسُولِ سَبِيلًا He says, I wish I followed the way of the Prophet. يَا وَيْلَتَ 
يا ليتني لم أتخذ فلانا خليلا لقد أضلني عن الذكر بعد إذ جاءني وكان الشيطان للإنسان خذولا I wish I have never befriended that person and that is Ubay the one that came to him and he said you have to go and do this to Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam this man has deviated me had taken away from the straight path after I was close to it and the shaitan is always the enemy of mankind another event that happened at the, the this persecution time and we know that some of the Muslims were in Habasha they had the first and the second migration to Habasha to Avicenia, to Ethiopia today and uh, so this event caused some of them to come back including Uthman ibn Affan and we will talk about this uh, also beautiful uh, uh, event that happened and the beautiful ayahs that were revealed at that time Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam was uh, given the last few verses of Surah Al-Najm of Al-Najm and uh, you can actually get the uh, Quran and follow up with that if you want to uh, and then uh, Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam to as powerful as strong these verses are he stood he waited till Quraysh was busy around the Kaaba and a lot of people the many there's a crowd down there and then he stood up there and he started reciting and then everybody started listening the people of Quraysh, the honorable of Quraysh and then the believers everybody who started listening to these powerful, powerful verses in Quran and it goes وَأَنَّهُ هُوَ أَضْحَكَ وَأَبْكَى وَأَنَّهُ هُوَ أَمَاتَ وَأَحْيَى speaking of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala He is the one that make you laugh, make you cry He is the one that gives you life and gives you death. وَأَنَّهُ خَلَقَ الزَّوْجَيْنِ الذَّكَرَ وَالْأُنْثَى And he is the one that created male and female. مِنْ نُطْفَةٍ إِذَا تُمْنَى Out of his sperm. وَأَنَّ عَلَيْهِ النَّشْأَةَ الْأُخْرَى He will recreate you again on the day after. وَأَنَّهُ هُوَ أَغْنَى وَأَقْنَى وَأَنَّهُ هُوَ رَبُّ الشَّعْرَى and he is the one that gives you wealth and gives you sustenance and he is the lord of your destiny and he is the one that sent torment on Ad and then he eliminated the people of Thamud and and before them, the people of Nuh, because they indeed were most transgressful against Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And the people of Fir'aun, and the people of, of Shu'ayb, and Mu'tafika, they, they were also destroyed by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. In which of the, of the miracles and the signs of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala are you rejecting? Which one are you turning down? And then it goes on to the very powerful closing there. هذا نذير من النذر الأولى Indeed, this is a warning, a very serious warning of the very first warning. أزفة الأزفة ليس لها من دون الله كاشفة This is indeed a very serious time where a dangerous and a very near, the end is very near, that is the day of judgment and the, the torment is coming and there is only Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala that can, that can reveal and that can take this uh, away أَفَمِنْ هَذَا الْحَدِيثِ تَعْجَبُونَ وَتَضْحَكُونَ وَلَا تَبْكُونَ وَأَنْتُمْ سَامِدُونَ فَاسْجُدُوا لِلَّهِ وَعْبُدُوا and of this, of this Quran you laugh of this you smile and do not cry and then you are here uh, making fun and making sarcasm out of it, you may prostrate and make sujood and worship Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And this is actually a verse of sujood, we may have to make sujood at the end of this. Uh, and then Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam made sujood. And then the mu'mineen made sujood. And then as powerful as this ayah were, the 
and unbelievers, the Quraysh, they all made sujood to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And Al-Walid ibn al-Mughira was sitting there and he was very old, he couldn't even make sujood, so he took some of the dust and he put it on his head. In, in, as powerful as these verses were delivered to him. And he's the one that, that we know how, how uh, uh, strong was he in rejecting the ayah of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Out of this event, a rumor started that Quraysh became all Muslim. That Quraysh came into Islam. So that rumor spread from one town to the other until it reached Habasha, it reached Abyssinia, and the Muslims there heard it, that, that uh, Quraysh, Mecca is now a Muslim town. So some of them believed it, some of them did not believe it. The one that believed it came back, and uh, came back to Mecca. And uh, among them was Uthman, Uthman ibn Affan. And this, these verses started seeping into, into Quraysh and to the heads of the noble of Quraysh, and they started listening to this powerful Qur'an. And some of them started coming in secrecy to listen to these beautiful verses. One night, Abu Jahl, Abu Sufyan, Al-Akhnas ibn Shuraiq, three of the, of the most uh, strong and, and, and bitter enemies of Islam, met each other close to the house of uh, Abu Al-Arqam, listening to Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam reciting Qur'an. They looked at each other, what are you doing here, what are you doing here? He said, well, I just came to listen, to see what this is all about. He said, okay, we have to, to vow that we will not come here again. He said, okay, it's a promise. The second night, each one of them sneaked out, came over there, and here there again, they see each other, the three of them again, listening to Qur'an. And they said, well, we, we really, uh, you know, we all uh, broke our vows, we all broke our promise, we will not do this again. So they made another promise, they will not come listen to Qur'an again. And these are the, the masters, I mean, these are the, the ones that are leading the fight against Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa The third night, they see each other again under the same window in the same place, listening to Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa And then they said, what, what is the deal? Why are we doing this? How come this is so attractive? Is what he's saying, could this be the truth? Then Abu Jahl said, and, and this he said, what he really believed in at that time, he said, We always compete with honor with the people of Abd Manaf. They gave food, we gave food. They give money and sustenance. We do the same thing. This is something we can compete with them. أعطوا فأعطينا. They spend, we spend. حتى إذا تجاذبنا الركب وكلنا وكنا كفراسي رهان. That means when we were head to head, like two horses in a, in a race. That's how close they are. Just you know, one, one inch back, one inch forth. Well, we're fighting this honor. Then they said, we have a prophet that comes with message from the sky. How can we compete with this? Wallahi, I will never believe in him. That's the bottom line to him. It's an honor that he cannot reach. How come the people of Bani Abd Manaf will have a prophet and his tribe does not have a prophet? He said, I will never believe in him. And then they started, the people of Quraysh and, and their nadwa, they started thinking, well, this is starting to get to us, this uh, da'wah, this message, starting to get really serious where we are listening to it, we are taken by it, we are influenced by it, we have to do something. And they said, we have to start a full embargo against Muslims, against the people that follow Muhammad. We will not talk to them, we will not sell them, we will not buy from them, we will not marry from them, and we will not marry to them. And if the people of Abu Talib and Banu Hashim, they wanted to protect Muhammad, and they want to deal with him, and sell him, and buy from them, then we will also have embargo against them as well. So they decided to write a treaty 
to write a piece of paper so they all be bound to it by this treaty. And they gathered at a place called Khaifu Bani Kinana. And it's known today as Al Khaif. Those of you who went to Hajj, we know at Mina, by the place where you stone Shaitan, there is a big masjid. And that masjid is called Masjid Al Khaif. That's where we, that's that place used to be a place of gathering or for the people of Kinana. And that's where they gathered and wrote this treaty. And uh, th- there is a, a uh, controversy about who exactly uh, wrote what the, the treaty itself. Uh, there are three uh, narrations, Mansur, Ibn Ikrimah, and Nadr ibn al-Harith, or Bughayd ibn Amr, ibn Hisham. But most uh, agree that the person that wrote it was one of those uh, people of Abd al-Dar. We remember they were in competition with Abbanu Abd Manaf, even from before Islam. We talked about this, the conflicts that, that, that happened between them. And they started, Bismik Allahum, in the name of you Allah, and they, uh, to, uh, they put the, the uh, treaty that they, we will not sell them, we will not buy from them, we will not talk to them, we will not go to their houses, we will not receive them in our houses, we will not marry from them, they will not let them marry from us. Complete embargo. Social and economical. And they took this piece of paper and they put it in Kaaba. And the person that wrote it, whichever the narration is, his hand eventually became uh, paralyzed. He lost the use of that hand that wrote that, that treaty with. So Ab- Abu Talib decided to take the people that are affected by this embargo, because now it's time for cooperation. The people that are affected by this, if everybody stayed alone, they will be starved, they cannot help each other. But if they're together, they may be, you know, uh, they can share whatever little they have, they can help each other, they can take care of each other. So he took them into a valley outside Mecca, it's called in Arabic Sha'b, and that valley was called Sha'bu Abi Talib. And in that place, in that valley, Muslims stayed for three years, along with their supporters of uh, Banu Hashim that were not Muslims. So the embargo was combined against Muslims and those who support them, those who actually just do not want to fight them, were also affected by this embargo. And it was a huge humanitarian disaster. It was a time for famine and starvation and suffering for Muslims. And that's the way of unbelievers. They think that they hold the treasures of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. That they hold sustenance against uh, mankind and those who believe. And if they have an embargo, then they can starve people to death. Yes, Muslims starved. But that's also a test from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to see here their endurance. So see what they had to go through. They were physically tortured. They were socially tortured. And they were economically tortured boycotted and and had a significant embargo against them. They had to go through physical agony and starvation. So Quraysh would not sell them food. But what if somebody from outside Quraysh had food? Here's what, what Abu Lahab did to solve this problem. So they may Muslims may go in and buy some food from those uh, merchants that come from outside Quraysh. Abu Lahab came to the marketplace and he said, Ya Ma'ashara Tujjar. He talked to all the traders and the merchants. غَالُوا عَلَىٰ أَصْحَابِ مُحَمَّدْ حَتَّى لَا يُدْرِكُوا مَعَكُمْ شَيْئًا He said, if anybody of those companions of Muhammad wants to buy anything, then we then just go and buy it before they buy it with a higher price. Be higher bidders than them. Just whatever they want to buy. If they want to buy some food, well, let's say 10 dinar, pay 15. And then you sell it. And whatever the difference, I will cover it for you. So you would not lose any money. وَقَدْ عَلِمْتُمْ مَالِي وَوَفَائِي بِعَهْدِي He said, you know that I'm a rich man? And you know that I, a man of my word. That I am a man of my word. When I say, I will do. So he put his money dedicated to complete this embargo 
and to starve those Muslims. And that's why Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala said, مَا أَغْنَى عَنْهُ مَا لُهُ وَمَا كَسَبْ His end was going to be the hellfire. And in Surah Al-Masad, we know Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala said that his money will not prevent him from reaching this hellfire. We ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala refuge in that. So this, this test was very hard on Muslims. They starved. They had nothing to eat. They started eating the leaves out of the tree. One of them had, this is story in Sahih, that he was going out to, uh, out to, to far away to use the bathroom, and he tripped and he felt that there is a piece of a skin out of a carcass of, of a dead camel. And that was his food for three days. They had to eat the food of their own uh, camels and sheep because they had nothing to eat. But some, some people of Quraysh started feeling for them in, in a human way. Not that they sympathized with their religion in any way. But they had connections like they were relatives with them. They're, 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 we're talking about a tribal society. We're talking about uh, people that had families. Some of them were Muslim, some of them were not. So even if your cousin is a Muslim and you see their children starving, you see people dying of starvation, some people could not take that, even though they were not Muslims. They were idol worshippers, they were unbelievers, but they still could not take this, this time of treatment. One of them was Hakim ibn Huzam. Hakim was the cousin of Khadija, may Allah be pleased with her. And one time he put a lot of wheat on a camel and he was driving this camel out, riding it out, uh, going towards the valley of Abu Talib. Season Abu Jahl. Hakim, where are you going? I said, that's not in your business. Laysa bishan. He said, well, I see that you have food on this camel. Where are you going? Abu Jahl wants to be the master of Quraysh. Hakim is a noble man in Quraysh. He couldn't take Abu Jahl talking to him like that. He said, Laysa bishanik. I told you that's none of your business where I'm going. He said, Ta'khudhu ta'ama li Muhammad wa ashabih. You're taking food to Muhammad and his companion. He said, that is my business. Dalika sha'ni. So he's now he's challenging the authority of Abu Jahl. While they're taken back and forth, the man comes, his name was Abu al-Bukhturi ibn Hisham. And he said, what's going on? Abu Jahl said, I will not let him take this food. He's going to give it to uh, Muhammad. So Abu al-Bukhturi asked Hakim, he said, what's going on, Hakim? He said, my aunt Khadija has this, she's a rich woman. And this is part of her wealth. And I'm taking it back to her. I had it with me. And Abu al-Bukhturi said, that's fair. You take her money to her. Abu Jahl said, Wallahi, you will not take that money to her. And they started fighting. And then Abu Jahl started fighting with Abu al-Bukhturi. And then both Hakim and Abu al-Bukhturi started fighting back with Abu Jahl. And it ended up where Abu al-Bukhturi took a bone uh, that was uh, around from, a, from a, a camel. And he hit Abu Jahl on his head and he made him bleed. And then both of them, and, and the, the narrator, narration actually, they actually just just uh, kicked them and, and, and they beat them real good. So he uh, could not prevent that kind of, of uh, some of that food going back to them. Another person that was also very uh, active in taking food to Muslims, was his name was Hisham ibn Amr al-Amiri. Hisham used to put food on, on a camel, but he didn't have this, uh, challenging authority against Abu Jahl and, and his people. So he would just direct the camel towards that uh, valley and let the camel go on its own. And he will just let, let the leash off and the camel will eventually reach the Muslims on the other side. So there was this, this human uh, uh, sympathizing between some of the people in Quraysh and uh, some Muslims. But this lasted three years. This famine and starvation and, and embargo and, and sneaking food in and sneaking food out. So some of the honorable people of Quraysh got really tired of that. And this Hisham, the guy that used to push the camels and smuggle the food all over them, he said, I will do whatever I can to end this disaster. 
this catastrophe, this human problem. And he went to a noble man, his name was Zuhair ibn Umayyah, ibn Abi Umayyah. And he went to Zuhair, and Zuhair was sitting up eating, and he had this food and everything else, and, and he sat with him, and he said, Ya Zuhair, أَرَضِيتَ أَن تَأْكُلَ الطَّعَامِ وَتَشْرَبَ الشَّرَابِ وَأَخْوَالُكَ بِحَيْثُ تَعْلَمِ Would you accept that you're sitting here eating, drinking, and filling your stomach, and you know that your cousins and your uncles and your aunts are just starving and, and suffering? He said, Zuhair, I'm only one person. What do you want me to do? وَيْحَكَمَ asma. If you bring me another guy, that another person that will co- co- collaborate with me on this, maybe I can do something. He said, I have another person. He said, who's that? He said, me. I will collaborate with you on this. So now we have Hisham and Zuhair. So I said, well, let's find, let's find a third person. We'll, we'll become stronger. This is Abu Jahl, this is Shayba, this is Utbah. These are people that are not easy to deal with. And then he said, okay, he went on to the, uh, another person uh, named Al-Mut'im ibn Adi. Some of these names are important to remember because they will come with us later on and, and how they were treated kindly back by Muslims uh, when they had the upper hand. And then Al-Mut'im ibn Adi, they told him, do you, do you like this situation? Do you accept this? And he said, no, it's, this is sad, this is uh, terrible. He said, then uh, would you cooperate with us? And he said, yes, I will. But we need a fourth person. So they went to Abil Bukhturi ibn Hisham, the guy that uh, hit Abu Jahl on his head. They knew that he would sympathize with them. And Abu Bukhturi, of course, answered them. The, the fifth, he said, but let's get a fifth person. So there'll be many of us and, and we can work on this in, in a real uh, good way. So they went into a fifth person and his name was Zam'at ibn al-Aswad. And the five of them decided, they, they went ahead and they met in secret. And they said, uh, after they met in secrecy, they said, let's, let's plan how we're going to do this. And they had a plan. There are only five of them, and the noble people of Quraysh are many. So they still, although there are five of them, they do not represent the majority. The majority want this embargo to go on, want Muslims to starve, want Muslims to die. So they said, well, let's do this in, a, in an intelligent way so we can, we can pull this off. So one day, uh, uh, Zuhair wore his best clothes and he came around the Kaaba and he made tawaf seven times and then he stood in, uh, around Dar and Nadwa where they used to meet and he said and, and the people of Quraysh Ya Ahla Mecca people of Mecca Ana akulu ta'am wa nalbasu thiyab wa banu hashim halka la yuba'una wa la yubta'u minhum wallahi la aqrib حَتَّى تُشَقَّ هَذِهِ الصَّحِيفَةُ الظَّالِمَةُ He said, O people of Mecca, we here enjoying our food, enjoying our water, enjoying our clothes, enjoying our life. And our cousins, the people of Bani Hashim, are up there starving and dying. Wallahi, I will not settle down, I will not stop until I tear down this treaty. Abu Jahl stood immediately. He said, كذب. You will not do that. Wallahi la tushak. He swore, he vowed, this will not happen. And then Zam'a came over. Remember there's five of them. He said, Wallahi anta agzab. No, you're lying. So they started challenging his authority. Abu Jahl is like, what's going on? He said, when we wrote this treaty, we, we did not approve on everything in it. You were the one that, that, that decided on this treaty. Abu Jahl said, no, you, there's only two of you. And then a third person comes over. And Abu al-Bukhtari said, no, they're right. And a fourth person come, and a fifth person. Abu Jahl said, look at this, everybody, what's going on? Yesterday we were all in agreement on this. Now everybody is screaming and they want this to be over. He said, wait a minute. هذا أمر قضي بليل. This is something that you have conspired to do. And... This is something that you have plotted against me. But the people of Quraysh were stunned. They were like, what's going on? Everybody doesn't want this treaty to go on. Abu Talib was sitting in the corner of Al-Masjid, of, uh, around the Kaaba. And he stood up and he said, My cousin, my nephew, Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa told me something. And he never tells me something and he lies about it. 
He said Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala had sent some type of insect, a termite, to eat the paper where this treaty was written on. He's, uh, he's t- taken advantage uh, of this uh, chaos that happened with these five people. And the only thing that is left in that treaty is the name of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. If Muhammad was true, then you should stop what you're doing to us. And if he's not, I will give him to you. Is that what you want? You want Muhammad to, to kill him? Then I will give him to you. So everybody in Quraysh, despite Abu Jahl, said, yes, that's a fair thing. Because now they're, they felt like they're divided on this. They wanted some kind of a solution. So they opened the door of Kaaba, they went into the Kaaba, and subhanAllah, everything in that paper was wiped out and eaten by that insect, except for that word, Bismik Allahum, stated the name of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And from that day on, this embargo was null and void. The embargo ended. And that's how Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala ended the suffering of the Muslims after it lasted for three years. And that was at the early time, the early months of the 10th year of Ba'tha, the 10th year of the, starting the message. And Rasulullah and his companions came out of the valley and went back to Mecca and went back to their houses. And he continued to be in the protection of his uncle Abu Talib. Then that did not last very long. Few months after they came out of the valley of Abi Talib, and that was one of the quietest period that they did not have much persecution or torment. After they came out of the valley of Abu Talib, Quraysh felt that Abu Talib is getting sick, and Abu Talib may be near his death in the tenth year of of Ba'tha. So they said that Hamza has become a Muslim, Umar has become a Muslim. This is in Ibn Ishaq. And Muhammad's uh, call, Muhammad's message, is now known in every tribe, in every clan, in every house in Quraysh. We have to take care of this before Abu Talib dies. Because if Abu Talib dies, then if we do something to Muhammad after that, the rest of the Arabian tribes will say, well, you waited until his protection is died, then you took him. Then you killed him. Then you did this to him. So you were cowards when Abu Talib was alive. And then when Abu Talib died, you took advantage of that. That doesn't look good. So why don't we try to do this and try to reach some kind of an agreement while Abu Talib is alive. So this is this is called the last delegation in, in the books of Sirah. The last delegation that went to Abu Talib. We know that in the beginning of Da'wah, many delegations went to Abu Talib asking him to intercede and asking him to solve this, quote, conflict, unquote, between them and Muhammad. So now they, they send this last delegation to Abu Talib. And in that delegation, there was Utbah ibn Rabi'ah, Shayba ibn Rabi'ah, Abu Jahl, uh, Umayyah ibn Khalaf, and Abu Sufyan ibn Harb, among other. And in some books it said 25 people went on that last delegation. And they came to Abu Talib and they said, Ya Abu Talib, innaka minna haythu qad alimt. We, you know that you are an honorable person and you're one of us. You know, he's not a Muslim. Waqad habaraka ma tara. And you see what happened to you. They mean like you're really near death. I mean, he was above 80 years old and he was very sick and he was basically dying. And they said, Wata khawafna alayk. And we, we're afraid for you. We fear for, for you, for you that, that you may not make it through this. You know what is happening between us and your nephew. Fad'uhu. Call him. Let's talk. You become the judge. You see what we have to say and what he has to say. Let him stop his da'wah. Let him stop his call. And we will let him practice his religion. Let him leave us alone. Don't start calling on our children to follow him and, and our people and, and, and our slaves and our servants and everybody to follow his religion. Let him just keep it to himself. And we will let him do whatever he wants with him and himself and his companions. And we will do whatever they want, we want. Let's just uh, have some kind of, of a treaty. Then Abu Talib called Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. He said, you know, this is what happened. Here's the honorable people and they're trying 
to, to give you this last uh, offer. What do you say? Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said, Ya uncle, kalimatun wahid. Just give me one word. Tamlikuna biha al-Arab wa tadinu lakum biha al-Ajam. You will be masters, the kings of Arabia, and you will extend beyond Arabia, the non-Arabs. Abu Jahl, that sounds, he said, Naam, wa ashru kalimat. Not only one word will give you, we'll give you ten. Just tell me what you want. He said, La ilaha illallah, Muhammadur Rasulullah. All I'm asking you to do is to say, La ilaha illallah, Muhammad Rasulullah. And this, this thing that you think is an honor, this will extend beyond Arabia. This is, this is not only uh, confined to this. This is a much bigger thing. That's what he's trying to tell him. And then Abu Jahl said, they said, the, the, the people in, in uh, the narration, Bani Ishaq, they said, they started uh, tapping their heads, said, Subhana, what, what is this? O oh Muhammad, Aturidu an taj'ala al-aliha ilahan wahidan, inna amraka la'ajib. Ya Muhammad, all these gods that we have, you may to confine it in only one God? What kind of a, what kind of a call is that? This is a very wondrous thing. This is a very weird thing. He said, Inna hadha la amrun ajib. This is something that we're wondering about. This is weird. What is this call? And then they talked to each other and he said, Wallahi, ma hadha rajul bi mu'atikum shay'an. It's useless to discuss with Muhammad. Muhammad will never come to terms with you. He doesn't want peace, this man. Subhanallah. Fantaliku. Wamdu ala dini abaikum. Steadfast on the religion of your fathers, this idolism. Hatta yahkum Allahu baynakum. Subhanallah, see how much they're lost. They said, until Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala become the judge between us and him. Subhanallah. And in that, so the, the verse, the, the first seven verses of uh, Surah Sa'd came over uh, about this last delegation. Sa'd wal Qur'ani did dhikr. بَلِ الَّذِينَ كَفَرُوا فِي عِزَّةٍ وَشِقَاقٍ Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala swears by the Qur'an. وَالْقُرْآنِ ذِي الذِّكْرِ Indeed, those who reject, it's not Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam is the one that, that does not want peace and does not want reconciliation. They are the ones that have arrogance and they do not want reconciliation. Continue on in Surah Sa'ad. كَمْ أَهْلَكْنَا مِنْ قَبْلِهِمْ مِنْ قَرْنِ فَنَادَوْ وَلَا تَحِينَ مَنَاصِ How many people we have destroyed before them and they only regretted it after it was too late. Don't they, don't they understand? Don't they take the wisdom from that? وَعَجِبُوا أَنْ جَاءَهُمْ مُنْذِرٌ مِّنْهُمْ they, they, they were wondering how come a, 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 a warner, somebody that was warning them, a, a prophet came among them. وَقَالَ الْكَافِرُونَ هَذَا سَاحِرٌ كَذَّابٌ They said, indeed, he is a sorcerer and he is a liar. أَجَعَلَ الْآلِهَةَ إِلَهًا وَاحِدًا إِنَّ هَذَا لَشَيْءٌ عُجَابٌ Did he make all the gods into one god? This is indeed something astonishing, something wondrous. وَانْطَلَقَ الْمَلَأُ مِنْهُمْ Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala describes the way they left the house of Abi Talib. وَانْطَلَقَ الْمَلَأُ مِنْهُمْ أَنِمْشُوا وَاصْبِرُوا عَلَىٰ آلِهَتِكُمْ إِنَّ هَذَا لَشَيْءٌ يُرَادٌ مَا سَمِعْنَا بِهَذَا فِي الْمِلَّةِ الْآخِرَةِ إِنْ هَذَا إِلَّا اخْتِلَاقٌ They, when they left the house of Abu Talib, they said, أَنِمْشُوا, let's walk away. And وَاصْبِرُوا عَلَىٰ آلِهَتِكُمْ Step fast with your gods. This is indeed the right thing to do. We have not heard of this before. We have not heard of this one God before. And this indeed is only a fabrication. And that's how Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala described this last delegation that came to Abu Talib. And Abu Talib becomes sicker. And he gets closer and nearer to death. And Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam comes to him in his final hours. And he sees Abu Jahl sitting by him. And he said, Ay am. Oh my uncle, قُلْ لَا إِلَهَ إِلَّا اللَّهِ Say there is only one God, that is Allah. Kalima, only a word. أُحَاجُّ لَكَ بِهَا عِنْدَ اللَّهِ If I have to argue on your behalf, 
I will have something to argue with with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. If I have to intercede, to intercede on your behalf, then that would be something that I can intercede with. Just say it. Say that word for me. And Abu Jahl and another one called Abdullah ibn Abi Umayyah, they were next to him and they said, Ya Aba Talib, atargabu an millati Abdul Muttalib? You reject the, 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 the religion of Abdul Muttalib, your father? Wallahi lanu'ayyirannaka biha abad al-dahar. If you said that, we will just say that you have, have rejected the, the religion of your fathers and you are afraid. And we will say that to everybody, forever. And they kept calling upon him to not follow the word of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam is asking him just to say the word. Just to say that word. And, and then he will intercede for him. <clears throat> then Abu Jahl and... Abdullah kept on Abu Talib until Abu Talib finally before he uh, died he said ala millati Abdul Muttalib indeed I die on the religion of Abdul Muttalib and then Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wasallam after his death he looked at his uncle and he said la astaghfiranna laka ma lam unha ank and all this what I'm narrating inshallah is from Al Bukhari on 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 very strong authority Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said, I will ask Allah for forgiveness. He loved his uncle. He was raised in the house of his uncle. This is the man that protected him. This is the man that was surrounding him through bad and through worse. And he said, I will ask Allah for, subhanahu wa ta'ala for forgiveness to you. Unless Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala tells me not to. And then the ninth, the 113th verse of the ninth chapter, which is Al-Tawbah, was revealed and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala said to his prophet, مَا كَانَ لِلنَّبِيِّ وَالَّذِينَ آمَنُوا أَنْ يَسْتَغْفِرُوا لِلْمُشْرِكِينَ وَلَوْ كَانُوا أُولِي قُرْبَى مِنْ بَعْدِ مَا تَبَيَّنَ لَهُمْ أَنَّهُمْ أَصْحَابُ الْجَحِيمِ It is not for the prophet or those who believe to ask forgiveness for those who rejected the oneness of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Even, even if they were their relatives, even though they love them. مِنْ بَعْدِ مَا تَبَيَّنَ لَهُمْ أَنَّهُمْ أَصْحَابُ الْجَحِيمِ After they knew for sure that they are the people of the hellfire. And then another verse came after that. إِنَّكَ لَا تَهْدِي مَنْ أَحْبَبْتْ وَلَكِنَّ اللَّهَ يَهْدِي مَنْ يَشَاءُ You will not guide to the truth those who you love. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala grants the guidance to those that he will. And that was in Al Qasas 2865. 56. And the both in Al Bukhari and Al Muslim, they're in two Sahih, these narrations and with these two uh, verses. There's some narrations and some uh, stories that, that circle around and they said Abu Talib has said the word in secret or he, uh, he had moved his lips with it uh, before he died and he has gone to Islam. All of these narrations have no, no authentication whatsoever. And it has been studied by many people that, that authenticate hadith. And in Al-Bukhari there is another place where uh, the fate of Abu Talib is uh, sealed. And that is uh, the hadith of, Ab- of uh, Al-Abbas ibn Abd al-Muttalib, the uh, uncle of uh, Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa and the brother of Abi Talib. One day he asked Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam and he said, مَا أَغْنَيْتَ عَنْ عَمِّكَ فَإِنَّهُ كَانَ يَحُوطُكْ وَيَغْضَبُ لَكْ what, what, how, how did you benefit? What did you do for your uncle, Abu Talib? He used to protect you and he used to be angry when you're hurt. He used to love you and feel for you. Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said, قَالَ هُوَ فِي ضَحْضَاحِ مِنَ النَّارِ He is going to hell, وَالْعِيَاذُ بِاللَّهِ to the hellfire, but he will be in the shallowest, shallowest place and the hellfire. وَلَوْلَا أَنَا And if it's not for that, if it's not for what he's done to me, for me, he would have been لَكَانَ فِي الدَّرَكِ الْأَسْفَلِ مِنَ النَّارِ He would be in the lowest and the deepest places of the hellfire. So that helped them. We know that 
that uh, hellfire is also uh, steps and and it it goes deeper and deeper so that would be that is actually something that increased the uh, sadness and the sorrow for Rasulullah sallallahu alaihi not only he lost his protector the lost the man that stood by him the man that was almost a father to him his uncle he also lost him without be, be him without know with, with that, that he knows that he's not going to go to paradise that he knows that his fate was going to be in the hell fire and then what happened very shortly after that Abu Talib died in Rajab in Rajab of the 10th year of Betha and then in Ramadan in the 10th year of Betha Khadija may Allah be pleased with her Khadija the Al-Kubra she gets sick and then she passes away very hard year for Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa Khadija was the companion of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa she was she was more than a wife Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam remembers Khadija later on and he, he has a hadith in Al-Bukhari and he said Amanat bi hina kafar al-nas She believed when people rejected Wa saddaqatni hina kathabani al-nas She said that I was saying the truth when people said that I was a liar Wa ashrakatni fi maliha hina haramani al-nas when people held their money from me, she was given all her wealth to me. وَرَزَقَنِ اللَّهُ وَلَدَهَا And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala sent me children that were from her. And we know that Khadija, may Allah be pleased with her, is one of the people that have the glad tidings that she's promised paradise. In Al-Bukhari, uh, Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam is narrating that Jibreel came to him and he said, that Khadija will be coming to you, Rasulullah. When she comes, فَإِذَا هِيَ أَتَتْكَ فَقْرَأْ عَلَيْهَا السَّلَامَ مِنْ رَبِّهَا That was when she was alive. He said, tell her that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is sending salam, greeting to her, himself. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala through Jibreel is sending salutation to Khadija. وَبَشِّرْهَا And give her the glad tiding. بِبَيْتٍ فِي الْجَنَّةِ in a house in paradise, min qasab, made of pearls, la saqaba fihi wa la nasab, where peace endures, where peace dwells forever. So, the sorrow increases for Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Here, in few months, he loses Abu Talib, and then he loses Khadija. After he lost Abu Talib, the harm and the persecution and the insults of Quraysh only became worse, became augmented. Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa lost the protection of his honorable uncle, and now not only few people in Quraysh dared to attack Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, he was only attacked by people that had high status in Quraysh before, Uqba, Abu Jahl, etc., etc. Now anybody, would come to Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam and hurt him or, or cuss him out or try to, to, to do something to him. One day he walks into his house and his head was filled with dust and dirt because some people, some of those mean people in Quraysh that, that had no stature whatsoever started throwing dirt and trash and, and dust on his head and his daughter started washing that and crying. And Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said, لا تبكي يا بنية. Do not cry, my daughter. فإن الله مانع أباك. Allah is the only protector. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is the one that protects your father. And then he said, he followed, ما نالت مني قريش شيئا أكره حتى مات أبو طالب. He missed his uncle and he said, Quraysh did not actually affected me and started really hurting me until Abu Talib died. And that, that year, that year that was full, filled with these sad and, 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 uh, and sorrow events was called the year of sorrow. The year of sorrow is the tenth year of Betha. That's three years before the Hijrah. And that year some other events that we need to go through is one of them that happened in Shawwal. We know that uh, Khadija radiallahu anha died in Ramadan. In Shawwal, Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam Marries. He marries a, a woman, uh, her name was Sawdat ibn Zam'a. 
and she's the second wife and we'll try inshallah try to go through the wives of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam our mothers uh, the ummahat al-mu'mineen and to go through their stories briefly to understand the circumstances to understand the wisdom and to understand who they are and and what they are about and Sauda was one of the early mu'min the early muslims that had the first migration to Habasha and at that time she was married to a man called As-Sakran ibn Amr. As-Sakran ibn Amr, may Allah be pleased with him, he was a companion and she was his wife. She, she, had, she declared Islam with him and she migrated with him to Habasha, to Abyssinia. And there are two narrations, one of them said he died in, in, in Habasha and some of them said no, he died after he came back to Mecca, but he died and she became a widow. Her family was very angry with her for two things, for, for marrying a Muslim, for being with a Muslim, and for uh, migrating to Habasha with him. So they started to harm her, and women in that society have no chance. I mean, we, we talked about how that society treated women. So now that, that woman is, is uh, an, considered an enemy to that society, a woman that rebelled on that society. And they started harming her. And Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam knew who she was and knew how truthful of a mu'min she was and knew who she, that, that she was a strong woman and he could not leave, leave her just suffer. And the first thing he did is he offered to her, become her protector and become her husband. And of course she uh, accepted. So Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam married her. She was not a young woman and uh, most of the narration that were narrated in some of the books, they said that she was a heavyweight woman, that she was uh, 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 an, an elderly person. So this was not a marriage that, that indicates that Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa and uh, had any desire for women. He married Zawda, no doubt, that if he had any desire for women, he would choose a young, beautiful woman to marry. But he chose this more older the older woman that, that is a widow to protect her and to defend Islam. And even though she's one of the, some of the things that happened in her life that we derive some fuqah from is on the night uh, after people came from Arafah uh, and Hajj, when Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa was making Hajj at that time, uh, she was older, she was really going uh, up in age, and she was heavy as we said, so that was a very hard trip for her. And Rasulullah gave her permission to leave Muzdalifah after midnight, instead of waiting till dawn. And this is actually a ruling that a lot of people still follow till today, and that came from Sauda. <coughs> Another wisdom that we take from marrying Sauda, Rasulullah, we know how Rasulullah, what is the stature of Khadija and the heart of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. We have no doubt that Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam held Khadija very dearly in his heart. But it is very important to take this lesson from Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam who says, النكاح sunnati Marrying is my way of life. Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam did not stay as a widow for a long time. He married in Shawwal, Khadija died in Ramadan. So he waited what? A month, less than a month to get remarried again. Because Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa knows that a man, this is his way, this is his sunnah, that a man will need to be married. So that is some, also something that we learn from that. We inshallah just close with some of the lessons of this stage that we just passed through, the persecution, the suffering, the, the torment, the torture, the embargo, the economic uh, problems, the famine, the starvation. And we have to look and see how did they go through it? What are the things that helped the Muslims and the companions to go through such hard times? They were minority. Very, man, very much of a minority. Some of them were slaves. Some of them were newly freed, freed slaves. Some of them were servants. They were in the, most of, a lot of them were, were in the lowest ranks of society. Even those that had high ranks in society, that did not protect them. Abu Bakr was beaten. Umar was beaten. Uthman was beaten. Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam himself 
we see what they have done to him. And he is one of the honorable people. So they were hit hard. How did they go through this? What are the things that made him endure and survive and succeed through this hard period? And we are 10 years now into Islam. There are many, many reasons and we will go through them inshallah briefly. But the first one is faith. They had unshaken, deeply rooted iman. Faith in Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. That they, this cannot be, cannot be moved. They knew their creator. They believed in Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala deeply where nothing, no torture, nothing will be, will shake their will. Bilal was asked, why would you say ahadun ahad? What, what, why this word? When you are, he's being tortured, he would be, the stones would be laid on top of him with, with heat and, and he would be tortured and the only thing he would say ahadun ahad. He said, why ahadun ahad? Why, why would you not say any other, any other word? He said, this is the word that say the oneness of Allah and this is the only word that would make them angry. He would look at his tortures and this is the word that will make them angry. The one, Allah, the wahid, ahadun ahad. The second thing that let them go through this is the leadership. Leadership of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam was tested in every way possible. Nobody can say that they have ever can be tested more than Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will send them as a witness on humanity. And he was the one, wa alaykum salam, that was tormented, that was tested the hardest. And then yet, he was an example, a role model of good manners, good behavior. He had many occasions where he could ask for torture and torment to come on his people. And prophets have done that before. Nuh has asked for that. Many prophets have asked for, for this to end. Yunus left his people. He could not take it anymore. Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam with his leadership steadfast and had patience and had endurance. Hence the people around him followed in his footsteps. And they had patience and they had endurance. He was the truthful that even those people that rejected his, his deen, rejected his religion, rejected his call, still could not reject him, still knew that that man was, was in somebody that you would need to believe in. We remember one day when he, Rasulullah was, was being insulted every time he made tawaf around the Kaaba, and then he looked at them and he said, Ya ma'ashara Quraysh, jiktukum bidhabah. Indeed, I just brought torment to you if you don't believe in this. And they all came to him and asked for, for they believed him. This is a man that they were saying, he's a liar, he's a crazy madman. Then if, if they really deep in their heart believe that he was a madman or a liar, then whatever he says should not matter. But anything he said, they really took very seriously. Very seriously, because they knew that he was the truthful man. And then the people around him, they loved this leader. And this love showed in their, in their behavior, in their actions. Abu Bakr one time was beaten so hard when he was defending Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. When he came and we went through the story before, so I won't go through it in details. But Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam was being attacked that second day uh, after he, he uh, uh, warned Quraysh. And then Abu Bakr came to, to help him. And then Abu Bakr was taken and beaten where the, the one that described that event said, you look at Abu Bakr's face and you cannot see, you don't know where, where his nose is. You wouldn't know of the swelling of his face and the blood that was covering his face. That w- where is the nose? Where are the eyes? Where is the, you cannot tell his features anymore. He was beaten so hard that, that nobody, and then they carry him to his house. And they laid him, so they thought that he's definitely going to die after that beating. This is how Abu Bakr had to endure. And then when Abu Bakr first came back to his conscience, the first thing he said, what happened to Rasulullah? And they said, I, we don't know what happened to Rasulullah. See this love, I mean this is a man that is beating so hard and people are just helping him, giving him that first aid. And they said, well, we'll just send somebody, let me know what happened to Rasulullah. And they go from house to house 
until they come to him and they said, well, Rasulullah is at such and such house and he's being also helped. They said, take me to him. Don't help, I want to see him first. I want to make sure that he's okay. That was the love that they had for Rasulullah wasallam. And that was the leadership. The third thing that got them through this is their feeling of responsibility. They knew that they're carrying this for all of us, for generations. They knew that they could not give up, that they could not turn this down. They felt that responsibility of the message, that they had to carry this throughout generations to come. And then the fourth thing that let them go through this is they believe in the hereafter. They knew that this is temporary. All the beating, all the starvation, all the torture, all things that they had to go through, anything that we have to go through is temporary. إِنَّ الْآخِرَةَ لَهِيَ الْحَيَوَانِ the, the life after death is what we look for as Muslims. Anything we, we face in this life is something that is, that is passing through. And that, they felt that, they believed in that, and that helped them take anything for this doubt. And the fifth thing that made them also endure and be patient with it was Al-Qur'an. The verses of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Every now and then, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala reveals surah to, to help them, to make him stronger. To, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala said, وَنَزَّلْنَا لِنُثَبِّتَ بِهِ فُؤَادَكَ to, to make it, to make the Qur'an, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala send it in, 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 in different uh, verses and everyone would come at a different time. So the heart of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam and the heart of those around him will be steadfast, will, will, be, will hold strong for this da'wah. And then the, the sixth thing is al-bisharat, the glad tiding, that Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam always reminding them of how things going to end, not only in the life after. One time Khabbab came to Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. We know how Khabbab was tortured. Khabbab was one of the ones that had the worst torture, the worst kinds of torture. People could not look at his scars years and decades after that and without crying. He was tortured so bad. He came to Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. He said, Ya Rasulullah, ala tad'u lana. He came to him after one of those torture sessions. He said, don't you pray for us. And Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa his red, he had his face turned red and he said, those before you used to be tortured where well, they would take the combs of steel and people will take the flesh out of their bones while they're alive. And then they would die for what they believed in. وَلَكِنَّكُمْ قَوْمٌ تَسْتَعْجِلُونَ وَاللَّهِ لَيَمْشِ الرَّاكِبْ إِلَى صَنْعَاءٍ لا يخشى إلا الله والذئب على غنمه والله this دعوة this دين ليتم هذا الأمر حتى يمشي الرجل that the man would walk to all the way to Yemen to Hadramaut and Yemen fears nothing means that Islam will conquer Islam will, will be the, 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 the right thing for this earth however you hasten you rush it so th- these glad tidings also help people to endure and be patient. We ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to give us some of these lessons, to make us endure the things that, that come through today, and every, every little crisis and every event that we have in life. Because we need not only to recite these stories and enjoy them, uh, they are very enjoyable, but the most important thing is to derive these lessons. These things that we can apply into our own life. We honestly have not been tormented or tortured like these people. These people, the the, the things that they went through, may Allah be pleased with them, no one has went through the same thing. We went through 10 years, 10 years of non-stop torture, non-stop torment. So we ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to teach us these lessons and to help us stand with it so we may be with them on the day of judgment and maybe with them and with Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa in paradise. We have inshallah a few minutes for questions and comments. So I will open that, the floor for that inshallah. The, the question is, uh, through the year, three years of the embargo in the valley of Abu Talib, did da'wah slow down or was it as effective? Actually it has slowed down significantly. Uh, but uh, in Ibn Ishaq there are two things. What, number one, he said that uh, during the sacred months, al-Ashhur al-Hurum, 
Rasulullah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam would come to Mecca. And the people of Mecca cannot kick him out. And he would still see the, the tribes that come to Mecca and invite them to Islam. So he did not stop that when he had a chance to do it. And after that embargo was over, the comment in there was that the da'wah then took uh, another uh, peak, that they, they, there was an exit. So that, that to me gave an indication that it had slowed some. But there's also that narration that during the sacred months, they would go back to Mecca, they would invite people to Islam, and they'll continue to do what we can. And there are even new Muslims, they will join them and go with them into the embargo. I mean, that's, that's to, to become a Muslim during that time is even more special. Uh, that, that you know that your your uh, Islam will just bring this onto you and you do it. So that subhanAllah is, is even more valuable. They actually, the, the, the message of that hadith and the, 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 the way that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam describe it, is they knew it in their heart. They first rejected it completely as an idea, but then the more they listened to it, the more truth they feel in it, so they get attracted to it. I mean, this Qur'an is so beautiful, so clear, that nobody can ignore it. We had so many, how many people that we've recited so far? Al-Walid ibn al-Mughira, Utbah ibn Rabi'ah, two of them, after they hear Qur'an, they came like they were under a spell. And, and they said, you know, that this Qur'an is not human words. And then these three people that would gather in secrecy, Abu Jahl and Al-Akhnas and Abu Sufyan, they felt the truth, but they rejected it for that reason. And that's how Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala reveals what's in their heart. Is they felt that that honor is passing on to them from them to Muhammad. Well, they should have been the ones to be chosen. And in Quran they said, لَوْلَا أُنزِلَ هَذَا الْقُرْآنُ عَلَىٰ رَجُلٍ مِنَ الْقَرْيَتَيْنِ عَظِيمٍ They had actually candidates to Allah better than Muhammad. They named two people, Al-Walid ibn al-Mughira and another man from Thaqif. And I'm blanking on his name now. They said, well, both would have been a better candidate. So they're not arguing that <laughs> this is the da'wah, but they just did not like that this is past, past them. And that's the, the message in there. It's in the same year, and we have not finished that yet, inshallah. There will be, uh, that's what inshallah discuss. It's in that year, in the year of sorrow, at the end of the year. And uh, we will, inshallah, discuss that in the next uh, next session, inshallah. Yes, so we have to stop for prayer. Subhanakallahumma bihamdika ashadu an la ilaha illa ad, astaghfiruka wa atubu ilayk. Allahumma alimna ma yanfa'una, wa anfa'na bima alamtana, wa zidna ilman wa fiqhan fi ad-dini ya arhamar rahimin. Wa salli allahumma ala sayyidina Muhammadin wa ala alihi wa sahbihi ajma'in. Subhana rabbika rabbil izzati amma yasifun. وسلام على المرسلين والحمد لله رب العالمين